Australia is an immigration nation. But a hundred years ago, this wasn't the plan. The Commonwealth of Australia was built on a paradox. The paradox was they were going to realise a utopia, but they were going to do it through excluding the vast majority of humanity. From 1901, this meant tough restrictions on immigration, the white Australia policy. We would be an exclusively white community. There would be no one in Australia other than members of the white race. This was the objective. The consequences were devastating. Had my sister and my brother been allowed to come to Bendigo, they would have died. They'd die because of a policy. Ironically, the utopian dream not only tore families apart, it also threatened Australia's economic future and may even have turned an ally into an enemy. It's a fine day, and in the distance, all these aeroplanes. Jesus, one fellow said, look at our air force. And his mate said, they are aeroplanes, we buggered. They got red spots on them, they're Japs. This is the secret history of us. How modern, multicultural Australia was forged against the odds. The story of how Australia became the immigration nation we live in today is a story that starts at Federation. It's a sunny autumn day in May 1901 and half a million people cheer the future King of England, the Duke of York, as he makes his way to the Royal Exhibition Building in Melbourne. You've got all this pageant and pomp and ceremony of dukes and the military and people waving streamers and grand arches. Here we all are at the beginning of something incredible. It is here that Australia's first federal parliament will be opened. The nation's founders are about to be sworn in before a packed crowd of 12,000 dignitaries. But this is not simply a ceremony. Led by Australia's first Prime Minister, Edmund Barton, the architects of this brand new nation are designing a country unlike any other. Australia would learn from the mistakes of other countries and create a society that was just so much better than the uh, societies of Europe, uh, England, United States. The foundations are already strong. In some states, women have the vote and workers are protected by legislation guaranteeing fair pay and conditions. But Australia's leaders want to build on this and create a working man's paradise. Quite simply, the most progressive and democratic society the world has ever seen. They see themselves as creating a, a brave new Commonwealth in which equality will rule and in which they'll be at the forefront of democratic social industrial advance. This whole federal apparatus is going to protect the, the social laboratory that Australia was to create a kind of utopia. But the dream also masks a deeply held fear. The founders of the nation feel threatened. Ironically, this means the bold and noble plan is designed to safeguard democracy, equality and freedom for one race and one race alone. White Australia was based on a paradox that Democratic equality required racial exclusion. 
these radical Democrats building a new society which would be based on the equality of working men, their equal political rights and their equal economic rights, that required, as they saw it, the exclusion of those they saw as servile races. There is no place in this brave new world for Aboriginal people. The first Australians are beneath contempt. The so-called scientific thinking of the day was that somehow the Aborigines were a relic of an early stage of human development. They had made it into the 19th century, into the early 20th century, by a quirk of fate. As these idealists built this new democracy, they consoled themselves with the evolutionary conceit that Aboriginal people were a dying race and that therefore, sadly, they would have no future in this brave new working man's democracy, that the most these progressive people could do, and they thought of themselves as compassionate, of course, was to smooth the pillow of the dying race. Those creating a white Australia also see Asians as inferior, incapable of belonging to this radical society. Yet ironically, many Asians are outside the Royal Exhibition Building, joining in the celebrations marking the birth of Australia. None are more involved than the Ohoi family. Q Lan and his father Louis are responsible for organising the centrepiece of Melbourne's Federation Parade. The grandfather and father paid a vast amount of money to bring a Chinese dragon out from China. And it was decided that Lung, which means dragon, should participate in the 1901 Federation celebrations in Melbourne. So here's Bendigo's dragon parading in the streets to celebrate the festival. The grandfather and father plus all the Chinese community from Bendigo would have been honoured and proud to be part of the 1901 celebrations. Dennis O'Hoy's family first came to the Victorian gold rush town of Bendigo in the 1860s. By Federation, they're part of a Chinese community that numbers 30,000 across Australia. In Melbourne, the Chinese Quarter is a vibrant hub of commerce and business. The Chinatown at the turn of the century was a place where people lived. There were lodging houses, there were families, children were growing up in the street. There were general stores, multiple general stores. When I think about when is that area at its peak, at its, at its best, at its most exciting? It is at the turn of the century. And beyond Victoria, multi-ethnic communities dotted around Australia feed the nation's economy. In Broome, in Darwin, in uh, Thursday Island, in Cairns, all those uh, substantial towns in the north of Australia uh, had very large Asian uh, populations or and or Pacific Island populations and in many ways they were the most economically important groups. Australia's population of more than three and a half million may be almost 98 percent white but to those in power even this small minority are a big problem. The economic success of the so-called servile races threatens the dream to create a white working man's paradise. The very first act of the immigration nation will be to destroy the fledgling diversity it was born with. The idea was that several generations later, we would be an exclusively white community. There would be no one in Australia other than members of the white race. This was the objective. The 7th of August, 1901. Having been inaugurated just three months earlier, Australia's first federal parliament is sitting in what today is the Victorian State Parliament building. The task, to debate the Immigration Restriction Bill. 
Legislation that will change Australia forever and protect the rights of their brave new democracy through exclusion. Australia's first Prime Minister, Edmund Barton, gets to his feet to deliver what will be, without doubt, one of the most important speeches he ever delivers in his entire life. And as he's getting up, in his hand he's holding a book, and it's by a fellow called Charles Pearson. And the name of the book is National Life and Character, A Forecast. Published in 1893, this Melbourne academics book was a global bestseller. It contains a chilling warning of what the future holds for the dominant white race. Pearson says quite explicitly, the day will come when black, black and yellow races are no longer under tutelage, that they will be independent, they'll be self-governing. He says they will even control the ships of the sea, the trade of the sea. And then he says, this will be totally humiliating for the white man. If we don't take care, our civilization will be overrun by, by China, by Africa, by India, by other cultures, other civilizations. Believing Pearson's analysis, Prime Minister Barton and his peers fear non-Europeans will destroy the progressive new democracy. So he proposes that all migrants wanting to enter Australia will have to pass a 50-word dictation test. Based on a model already used in South Africa, it's a sleight of hand that keeps out anyone who isn't white. It uh, appeared to not give offence. It appeared to be something which was about education and not about race. But it was applied uh, in a totally discriminatory way against non-Europeans. But for the opposition Labour Party, the pretense of the test should be done away with. They're particularly fearful of migrants undercutting the wages of Australian workers and demand an outright ban on anyone who isn't white. Their leader, Chris Watson, warns of racial contamination. His party colleague, Billy Hughes, goes further, demanding a white Australia by prohibiting the importation of a single coloured alien. Labor says, just say it as it is. Bang, put it down there like it's at a council meeting or you know, an argument between you know, the bosses and the workers. Just say what you want. And what do we want? We want a white Australia. We want no Chinese, we want no Indians, no Africans. That's what we want. So why can't we just say it? Australia may be an independent nation, but all new laws must still get royal assent from London. Secretary of the Colonies Joseph Chamberlain has an empire to think about. He knows if Australia unilaterally bans non-whites, British citizens in India and elsewhere will be outraged. Chamberlain will back the dictation test, but warns Barton and Australia he'll not support an outright ban based on colour or race. Barton says, if we pass this law and make it racially explicit, it will imperil our relations with the empire. And that's as pretty much as dark a threat that you can put to the Australian people at the time because the Australian people need the British Empire to protect their shores. On the 26th of September, 1901, the vote is taken. Barton prevails as Labour's amendment is defeated by just five votes. The Immigration Restriction Act is passed. The dictation test, the device that will make it work. What will come to be known as the White Australia policy is enshrined in law. This is the founding of the nation, the rock on which the nation is founded. And it just so happens that the rock on which this nation is founded is an enactment of racial discrimination, a piece of legislation to exclude totally non-Europeans. News of the legislation spreads among Australia's diverse communities. And just months into its existence, 
the new nation already has an indelible stain on its reputation around the world. The Japanese felt incredibly humiliated and offended by this policy. The Japanese view was that Japan was a great power, in fact a much bigger power than Australia. And so why should Australia be um, discriminatory towards its own people? As the decades pass, Japanese humiliation will grow and fester into something far darker. But for now, Australia's ruling elite turn their attention to the many non-whites who have lived here for decades. The first port of call is the sugar fields of Queensland, where 10,000 South Sea Islanders toil. There will be no place for them in this new Australia. In the sugar plantations of northern Queensland, 10,000 South Sea Islanders live and work. They've been arriving here for almost 40 years. From 1863 to 1906, around that time, that's when the islanders were brought from um, the South Pacific. They brought here for the sugar industry to help establish it. Matthew Nagus's ancestors were among those who came tricked like many into leaving their island homes. They would lure them onto boats. They were shown things like pocket knives. Mirrors were another thing. They were um, given different types of tools. They would show them down to the holes of the boats. Once they got them down, they would shut the hatchets. There's even stories from some of the people where a whole village of men were taken. Mike Reader was in that process, and he was taken and brought here to Australia. Matthew's grandfather and all islanders are bound to three-year contracts of indentured labour. But what started as slavery becomes settlement. Many of them came again and again, and increasingly, numbers of them remained in Australia, in Queensland, after their period of indentured labour had run out. Those building the nation in Melbourne are now led by a new Prime Minister, Alfred Deakin. The very fact that the South Sea Islanders are beginning to settle is precisely why they threaten the white working man's paradise and the dream itself. There were already large numbers of Pacific Islanders who weren't under contract, who were free labour, who lived in the community, who were becoming property owners, who were marrying and having children, and in particular marrying Aboriginal women. These were the people who mostly concerned them because they were putting down roots in white Australia. The solution to the problem is uncompromising. The Pacific Island and Labourers Act of 1901 calls for the immediate deportation of the sugarcane workers. If we talk about people who were kidnapped and taken against their will, they were, they were forced against their will to go back to. They were uprooted and they had to leave behind all their memories of life in Queensland, but also friends and relatives. It was a ruthless form of ethnic cleansing. By 1908, around 9,000 islanders are deported. Louis from Burdekin is typical. He's forced to leave behind his Australian wife and son forever. Dear Rosie, tell Herbert that I can't see him no more. We will meet in heaven. You take Herbert with you and you take all my things. I no see my missus anymore. Goodbye, Rosie. 
and plenty of kisses. This last letter, your loving Louis. The social engineering to create a white Australia is beginning to work. But the dream will not be achieved by deportation alone. The so-called servile races must be stopped from coming in the first place. For that, there is the cunning of the dictation test. You're arriving in Australia at one of the ports and you're not wanted by Australia. You'll be met by a customs official who will sit down with you and he will read out to you 50 words that you have to write down. That's the dictation test. You're hearing it come, you're being read to you by an official and you have to write it all down. And if you don't write it all down, then that's it. You're not allowed into the country. The hairy adornment of the lion renders him more formidable in appearance. But the plain fact is... That they are truly astonishing passages, sometimes quite complicated scientific passages with a lot of really technical, complicated terms. So clearly one way you could get people to fail was to just have a very difficult passage of dictation that just about you know, no one could pass. But just in case, what was originally an English test is made even harder. Lornament, value, do, lion, lorend, plus, redoubtable, n, appearance. The customs official had the power to give to them in any European language and then any prescribed language. They made it any prescribed language. So it was basically foolproof. Um, and if someone managed to pass it, they could be given a second test. Uh, in another language so that they would ensure that they would fail. The test may be foolproof, but there are ways of avoiding it altogether. Kulan O'Hoy came to Australia before Federation. It means he qualifies for an all-important exemption certificate from the dictation test. He can come and go from Australia as he pleases. A dad in 1910, uh, by proxy, he marries my mother, who was then only 14, and in 1912, he was able to return to China and meet my mother for the first time, and then they decide to start a family. Dennis's father, Q Lan, is now desperate for his new family to settle in Australia. But his wife, Sui, and daughter, Toi Han, do not qualify for an exemption from the dictation test because they were born in China. With my mother and my sister, Toi Han, decided to catch a boat to come to Australia, they would have got to the shores, got to immigration, and they would then be asked to do the infamous dictation test to write an essay in a language which is unfamiliar to them, and there is no way they could have done it. So they would not have gained entry in Australia. Ten years after leading the celebrations at Federation, Dennis's father, Q Lan, has become just another Chinaman who stands in the way of the dream to create a white Australia. They couldn't be together. There was this big, massive barrier, the white Australia policy, that kept the family apart. This affected all Chinese families. They were not allowed to come in because they were Chinese. It was a cruel, an unjust act that it would divide families as it did with my family and put great hardship on family bonds. It was a very cruel act. By the outbreak of the Great War in 1914, Australia's population of almost five million is whiter than at any time in its history. But as more than 300,000 Australian soldiers go into battle, plans are afoot to bring people into the country. The first mass migration scheme is being plotted, not in Australia, but 12,000 miles away. The ideal to create a white utopia will be developed even further through the vision of a swashbuckling imperialist. <laughs> 
So Henry Ryder Haggard was the walking embodiment of the, the ultimate British Empire dream. He was a man who, who lived it, who wrote John Grisham-like novels about it, and who, and who spent his life sort of trying to secure the, not just the, the supremacy of the, the British Empire, but the expansion of the British race. A key advisor to the British government, Haggard believes the empire will be strengthened by a large-scale migration of Britons to the vast continent of Australia. Australians will become the young of the British. For Haggard, the British Empire was the, the great house with many empty rooms, and Australia was one of the biggest and emptiest of the rooms. And Ryder Haggard wanted the British race to fill all of the rooms so it could maintain itself in this vast house. And Australia had to be filled. Not only will the British pay for the scheme, but Australia will gain the people it needs to populate lands left empty by the removal of Indigenous Australians. In turn, the nation will be better able to defend itself against what it fears more than anything else, invasion from the Asian North. That, in a nutshell, was the Australian fear, the Yellow Peril. 400 million Chinese coming down, sweeping on the top of it, over the top of us. And that's how Ryder Haggard sold his idea for the British Migration Scheme. The war to end all wars is finally over. 60,000 Australian troops lie dead. But the horror of sacrifice and suffering will have unexpected consequences. The white Australia policy is about to come under the glare of an international spotlight. It's 1919, and now the Labour firebrand, Billy Hughes, is the nation's Prime Minister. At Federation, he called for a ban on all migrants who weren't white. The passing of time and the Great War has only strengthened his faith. Hughes was a remarkable character, small, deaf, but fiercely, fiercely determined, a union leader. He knew how to talk to men, but he was even more striking amongst the diplomats and aristocrats in Paris in 1919. The Paris Peace Conference will create a new world order. Out of the ashes of the Great War, a League of Nations will be born to secure peace for generations to come. In the cool January air, 72 delegates from 32 nations gather to begin six months of negotiations. The Big Four, America, Britain, France and Italy, hope to dictate proceedings. But there's now a new world power taking their place at the top table. The Japanese saw themselves as being the leader of Asia. And that was where the Japanese were heading. And certainly by 1919, because of the fact that Japan was selected as one of the five great powers, that sort of sentiment or the feeling was being confirmed by the Western great powers. They expected to be accepted as a civilized people. And they found, having jumped through all the hoops, there was one hoop they could never jump through, and that is they weren't white. The Japanese delegation led by Baron Makino Nobuaki has a very clear wish. They want racial equality enshrined into this new world order. It's a demand that could threaten the entire League of Nations and even make Australia's immigration policies illegal under international law. There were a number of political pressure groups back in Japan demanding that the racial equality clause had to be a condition of Japan's acceptance of the creation of the League of Nations. So the 
uh, Japanese delegates in Paris were put under enormous pressure from very powerful and influential lobbying groups in Japan in order to succeed on the racial equality negotiations. Billy Hughes has one main objective in Paris. He links the death of 60,000 diggers to the preservation of empire and white Australia. Anything that questions this assertion will be rejected out of hand. Japan's racial equality proposal is unacceptable. Hughes would insist that if there was any consideration of a racial equality clause, that the Australian delegation would leave Versailles bag and baggage. But as negotiations get underway in the opulent surrounds of the Hotel de Crillon, it seems that Hughes is not alone in his objections. The British Prime Minister Lloyd George and American President Woodrow Wilson also have strong reservations about the racial equality proposal. But they're determined to keep diplomatically quiet and avoid offending the Japanese. The British and the Americans, they don't want a strongly worded racial equality clause either. But there is the issue of relations with Japan. They now know if they don't support this racial equality clause, possibly Japan will walk away from the League of Nations. Uh, certainly their relationship will be harmed. But if they can move most of the blame onto use, if they can make use the patsy, um, then they can also get what they want. And so, in the rarefied air of Paris in the spring, a skillful plan is hatched. Britain and America will hold their tongues and point the Japanese towards the noisy hues. The Japanese were, were very patient and they tried again and again and they tried the Americans and the Americans said, well, it's not up to us, you have to talk to the British. So they talk to the British and the British say, well, we have a problem with these dominions you know, Australia and New Zealand and South Africa, uh, you'll have to deal with them. So the Japanese endeavour to uh, talk to all the leaders of the Dominions and uh, most of them say, well, you know, we, we wouldn't mind this, but there's always Australia that's the problem. The Japanese have no other option but to deal directly with Hughes and suffer the inevitable consequences. The Japanese found him impossible to negotiate with he was not very statesmanlike as far as the Japanese were concerned because other statesmen and delegates at the Paris behaved in a civilised manner, in a very diplomatic manner. They say, uh, this man is a peasant. Um, how is it that we have to try and deal with this ignorant uh, provincial from Australia? Why don't the British make him behave? Often Hughes pretended that he wasn't around when the Japanese requested to see him. And when they did, Hughes would just kind of, you know, pretend that he couldn't understand what they were saying when they were speaking to him, obviously, in English. Hughes's unique diplomatic approach is causing alarm at home. In Melbourne, the Director of Military Intelligence, Edmund Peace, believes the consequences of ignoring Japan's demands could be disastrous. Despite the fact Japan's an ally, the Australian military still sees Japan as its number one threat in the region. So for peace, if countries like Australia insist that there is no racial equality clause, that the Australians are actually walking into a trap. Despite peace's dire warnings, Hughes is unequivocal. White Australia must be protected. The Australian Prime Minister has played the role of Patsy to perfection. The American-British ploy works. The Japanese believe Billy Hughes is the central stumbling block. Indeed, Baron Makino, one of the senior members of the Japanese delegation, writes back to Tokyo that the racial equality clause, its fate, rests in the hands of one man, the Australian Prime Minister. After three long months of negotiations, the fate of the racial equality proposal and potentially the legality of white Australia hang in the balance. At the Palace of Versailles, a vote is taken.
A majority of delegates support the proposal. But the American president intervenes. Wilson, from the chair, said there's not unanimity and this is an issue on which there must be unanimity, therefore it is lost. Quite against all procedure of, of what had been regarded as normal meeting procedure in the League itself. The Japanese were mortified. The whole notion of the League of Nations was built on the idea that it should create a fairer and more just international order. And by denying this you know, supposedly basic, basic principle of equality of states, uh, how could this League of Nations um, really effectively uh, provide an international order? On the 28th of June, 1919, the peace treaty is finally signed in the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles. Denied its racial equality clause, Japan departs Paris humiliated and embittered against the West. Billy Hughes, on the other hand, leaves for Australia, head held high. Hughes returns to Australia a conquering hero, and always in his public speeches, he refers to the racial equality clause, and he refers to the protection of the white Australia policy. White Australia is yours. You may do with it what you please. My colleagues and I have brought that great principle back from the conference, as safe as it was on the day when it was first adopted. Hughes, already a hero to the Australian soldiers, has never been so popular. The little digger who went into battle at Versailles to save white Australia. But the triumphalism hides a grave truth. Back in Australia, people like Edmund Peace are devastated by the decision. They're devastated because Australia leaves Paris as Japan's number one enemy in the region. Well, there were people who saw the defeat at Versailles and as being one of those things which pushed the Japanese towards uh, militarism, imperialism, and militant anti-Western feeling. In the coming years, Japan's aggression will build. Ironically, by protecting its borders and the dream of a white utopia, Australia has helped sow the seeds for its darkest fears to be realized. Tilbury Docks in England, 1921. The British settler scheme proposed by Ryder Haggard has been given the go-ahead and the first organized mass migration to Australia is underway. Thousands of hopeful Britons will fill the vast empty lands, cultivate the soil and settle more than 20,000 new farms. Australia doesn't even need to pay. The British are footing the bill. It's very much an imperial vision for Australia's future. The British want to lock Australia back into the empire. And one way that this happens on the ground, literally, is through schemes of British settlement that are underpinned, underwritten for the first time by the British. For Frederick Chalice, the chance to leave his life behind as a poor farm labourer in Essex is too great. He sets off with his wife Rose and six children. It's a story of adventure that's been passed on to his granddaughter. Granddad realised there was no bettering himself. He wasn't going anywhere. He was going to stay like this forever unless something changed. They painted this wonderful picture. It was like, come to the land of milk and honey. You'll have a farm, fenced, cattle, a house, just everything. The sun shines all the time. It's going to be wonderful. They could actually see a future for themselves instead of standing still in, in England forever. And that to them was just a dream. 
As the door opens wide for the British, it is fast being slammed in the face of those trying to make their way to Australia from Asia. For seven years, Q Lan Ohoi has been desperately trying to bring his family to Australia. And with China now embroiled in civil war, he's convinced the lives of his wife Sui, daughter Toi Han, and son Billy are in imminent danger. Dad was upset in his letters to the government officials and bureaucrats. He is stating quite categorically that the village is under attack. He wants to bring his wife and he wants to bring his children to Australia. It's an unsafe place. And uh, the government officials are just, without an explanation, they'll reply, there's, no, visa will not be granted. So Dad would, again, write to another government official or another politician or bureaucrat for help. Dear sir, the locality where my wife lives, men and women go out guarding the place. Because if the brigands capture anyone, they would be cruelly treated and have to pay ransom. But Q-Lan's pleas fall on deaf ears and time runs out for the family. His son Billy dies of an illness and while Sui is out defending the village, his five-year-old daughter Toi Han dies in a tragic accident at home. Had my sister and my brother been allowed to come to Bendigo, on Dad's first request, they wouldn't have died. It's as simple as that. They died because of a policy. Too late to save his children, Q Lan is finally granted a temporary two-year visa to bring his grieving wife to Australia. Dad is given permission to bring my mother out and she arrives in Bendigo for the very first time. And through the reunification, two children are born. Myrtle is the firstborn and then George. Dad is happy, he's got his wife, he's got two newborn children. They're born here in Abendigo, they're Australian citizens. The visa starts to run out, so Dad writes more letters. Can I have an extension? No, your wife has to go. Faced with an impossible ultimatum, Q Land decides his young children, George and Myrtle, should also return with their mother to China. By splitting up families like the Ohoys, the Chinese community is slowly being strangled. The generation that arrived before Federation is growing old and dying out, and they can't be replaced. The Immigration Restriction Act and the Dictation Test are the perfect deterrent. Within a few years, people even stopped trying to come to Australia to sit the dictation test because it was a waste of money. And it was known that it was a waste of money. From its vibrant, bustling peak just two decades ago, the trading quarter of Melbourne is now in decline. Chinatown starts to shrink, and it starts to shrink dramatically. It's no longer taking up four city blocks, it's taking up two city blocks, then one city block, effectively. The unwelcoming nature of the legislation meant that the community couldn't be refreshed with new, with new people, with new family members, with uncles, with aunts, um, with, with children. By the early 1920s, the Chinese population in Australia has halved since Federation. Meanwhile, in Western Australia, thousands of Britons are arriving. The Chalice family are on the final leg of their journey. With high hopes and dreams of finding a land of milk and honey, they meet the great Australian outdoors for the first time. They were all dumped off the truck with their belongings and left there, and the truck disappeared. There was no farm clearing or anything. It was just virgin, thick bush. Everything had to be cleared by hand, morning till night, chopping and clearing and burning and trying to get 
some sort of paddock to put something on. But they thought, well, we obviously have been conned, but we've got nothing else, so let's go for it. They just kept working all the time. Just every bit was a bit more improvement. I don't know how he did it. The chalices make a go of it, but they are rare. Many have come from urban Britain and have no experience whatsoever of working on this or any other land. They couldn't farm. They didn't know how to farm. And they were brought to land that was utterly unsuitable for the sort of farming that they were told to do. It was quite a romantic expectation that they could leave, you know, wage slavery in the cities and become their own independent proprietors in Australia. The scheme is an unmitigated disaster. Fewer than 500 of the proposed 22,000 farms are settled at a cost of 15 million pounds, the equivalent of half a billion dollars today. And the scheme is about to be buried for good beneath a worldwide depression. The Wall Street crash and the Great Depression that took place subsequent was the, the worst economic disaster of the entire 20th century. But it was also the final nail in the coffin of the great British migration scheme to Australia in the 1920s. While the British go down with the crash, ironically, some of the migrant communities the white Australia policy is designed to destroy are surviving, sometimes with the help of ordinary white Australians. Quite often, although a local community might, in general, be against Asian immigrants, they were favourably disposed to their own Chinese, that everyone knew. That everyone knew the Chinese family who bought the fruit and vegetables, and bought better fruit and vegetables. And in a way, they got to know those families, and often were very protective of them. And it's not just the Chinese who are avoiding the ravages of white Australia. Since the 1850s, the Japanese have come to dive for pearls, their superior skill and bravery making them invaluable to the economy. The one place where the policy ultimately failed was in the pearling industry. They certainly tried, the authorities, to bring white divers to drive out the coloured labour, the, the Japanese in particular. But this was a lamentable failure. And the Japanese uh, captains, the, ja the Japanese seamen and the Japanese divers continued to be essential to the pearling industry right through the period of the White Australia. The Japanese migrants may be a godsend to the pearling industry, but Japan itself is fast causing alarm. Having invaded Manchuria in 1931, Japanese forces have now moved further into China. The ghosts of Versailles and the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 have come to haunt. The defeat of the racial equality proposal in 1919 was seen to be a highly significant factor in the 1930s, particularly by the militarists, uh, mainly because it was a, the most symbolic example of the West's rejection of Japan. With the Japanese advancing, the Ohoi family is still locked in their own very personal battle. Kulan now has four Australian-born children but they're living with his wife, Sui, in China because she is only allowed to come to Australia on a short-term visa. In 1935, Sui and the children arrive in Australia for another temporary two-year stay. The family is reunited again and everyone's happy, but it's only a short-term visa. There's the threat, my mother will have to go, which means the two boys and two girls will have to go. Dad finally has exhausted every avenue to keep the family together. I'm born in 1938. Dad is in the process now of buying the tickets for mother 
the four siblings, including me, were about to be, quite frankly, deported. But in an ironic twist, Dennis and his family win a late reprieve. Japan's invasion of China means all shipping is cancelled between Australia and the Far East. The authorities want to split up the Ohoys yet again, but there's no boat to put them on. <laughs> it took a war to keep my, allow my mother to stay and my siblings, including myself. It's extraordinary that it was a war, a world war, that enabled me to stay here in Bendigo. As Japanese forces bomb Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December 1941, the die is cast for Australia. The Japanese horde pours southward. Landings are made on the Philippines. Guam, Wake, Hong Kong fall. A huge Pacific area is Japanese territory by right of conquest. War laps the shores of Australia. Australia climbed behind her defenses and waited. It was a fine day with just a few light clouds about. And in the distance, all these aeroplanes. Jesus, one fellow said, look at our air force. And his mate had better eyesight, he said, they are aeroplanes, we buggered. He said, they got red spots on them, they're Japs. There were flights of dive bombers, heavy bombers, fighters. You name it, they were all there. Darwin, the 19th of February, 1942. Australia's darkest fears are realised. The invasion feared for generations could finally become a reality. The seeds sown at Versailles, the obsession to build a dream, have instead helped create a nightmare. There is a connection. This is not to suggest that Japanese militarism would not have happened without the racial equality clause. But that whole racial equality debate set in forth uh, a, a train of ideas, of tensions, of suspicions that f ultimately find voice first uh, at Pearl Harbour uh, and later with the Japanese attacks uh, on Australia. There's an almost unbelievable irony at work here. Australia had done everything to try and safeguard a white Australia and in an uncanny fashion helped manufacture the ultimate yellow peril threat that white Australia had first been invented to try and avoid. By World War II, 99% of Australia's 7 million people are white. Half a century of exclusion and restriction has socially engineered a nation. But just as this was achieved, the most extraordinary reversal was already being plotted. The post-war years will turn the policy of no entry on its head as Australia embarks on the largest migration program in its history. The battle to build modern, multicultural Australia is set to enter a dramatic new era. immigration nation, how Australia spins the arrival of a million migrants, yet somehow clings to the white Australia policy. The selection teams are instructed very clearly to select people from Latvia and the Baltic countries and to have blonde buxom women. 
And for an interactive version of the Australian immigration story, go to sbs.com.au forward slash immigration nation.